So we, you guys should be able to see my screen, correct? I see your screen. Yeah. yeah. I'm proud to introduce uh, Angel Garcia, our vice president. He's put together a few slides to stimulate conversation, talk about gardening in general. If you have questions that are specific to the plant list, feel free to interrupt. If you've got questions that are specific to gardening that are not yet addressed or don't seem to be on target to be addressed, ask those questions, please. And without further ado, I'll hand the meeting over to Angel Garcia. Um, take it away, Angel. Yeah, I mean, definitely this meeting, we want it to be as helpful as possible. If you have any questions about plants that you're thinking of getting, or if you have any any challenges or anything that you're like still unsure about before planting your natives, uh, hopefully we'll answer those questions today. Um, so for everybody that's has the doesn't that doesn't have a native garden yet, um, design is I think the biggest part. I interviewed a couple people for our newsletter um, about their native garden journey. And they've all said that the planning section is the most important. It's where if they planned well enough, everything else went fine. If they didn't plan well enough, uh, native plant they, ran society. Into, they ran into some issues later on. So Bloom California is a program that CMPS started. Um, they have some really good designs that you can follow. You can see A, B, C, D, E. Um, so they have some for like your health strip. If you have a tree, if you have a sunny yard, they have like a ton of different designs that you can follow. Um, but even if you decide to follow one of the designs that CMPS has put out exactly, it's still good to think about what went into making this design because it'll help you make your garden a success afterwards. Um, if you want to look at the designs that Bloom California has put out, just Google Bloom California. They have some pretty good designs and they have some pretty good tips. So definitely encourage you to check those out, even if it's just to give you a little inspiration. Um, but one thing that you want to consider when you're designing your garden is what you want it to look like for you, but you're also going to need to consider what it looks like to your neighbors. And you'll hear why from Brent. All right. Well, you know, we actually got an email from a uh, someone who lives locally and they said, I've got a neighbor that keeps reporting my garden to the city. And I, I don't know what to do. How do I how do I get the city and the neighbor to recognize that I've got a native plant garden here? And and the answer is Long Beach has a pretty progressive policy. This person was in Long Beach. And so I think they probably hadn't connected with the right uh, person yet. But I didn't see their garden. And their garden could have looked pretty messy to somebody that's used to, you know, pruned hedges and um, uh, mowing lawns. And it's that's a battle that we all have to fight as people that like native plants. And um, the the thing the thing to look up is something called cues to care. If you Google cues to care, you'll get you'll get a lot of information about it. But the idea here is that there's design elements you can put into any native plant garden that make it that make people know that it's a garden with intent. Um, that that somebody cares about the garden and therefore they should too. And this is actually an area of academic study. Um, and if you if you go on to um, like Science Direct, which publishes a lot of the scientific literature, you'll find papers dating back all the way to 1988, when people started to understand that there were design elements that you could put into gardens that make people care about them. And it's not just gardens. Uh, they talked to farmers in Iowa who said, oh, the way that my neighbor crops his, his rows uh, that I, that tells me that he cares about it. Or um, people who live near um, petroleum extraction sites, and they said, "What? Oh, well painted uh, petroleum tanks makes me know that people care about that area." And so um, the same thing is true of gardens. 
and it's 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 pretty simple. Um, I'll let you read the text, but I'll go through the the numbered bullets there. There's the obvious thing to do is to put up a sign that you can get one of those native plants live here or native animals live here signs. Um, you could register your garden with the um, oh, there's the, the wildlife uh, foundation. I think there's a bunch of different places you can get a sign that says, hey, this this garden is intentional. So that's super easy and super direct. Um, but there's other ways to express intent as well. And that is you can edging in borders tells people that you care and it has it shows that you've got intention as well. Um, if you keep your your uh, buckwheat from encroaching on the sidewalk and people can see that, then they'll they'll think, oh, okay, somebody's maintaining this garden. Um, there's um, things that you can put in there that invite people in are also good. So paths, seats, and fountains. And the picture on the left in the presentation has, is an example of some of that. They've got a, a railing there that's maybe not necessary, strictly speaking, but it certainly tells you that, hey, this is the way that people walk through here, and this is, an, this is for people to walk in. Um, if you have a neighbor or two that has the same design elements, then you're not sticking out like a sore thumb. So that's actually a, a strong indicator of whether people will accept your garden design is whether your neighbors have something similar. So go out and recruit a neighbor or two. Um, it's the local norms. In the, in the, in the tree-lined streets, the house that doesn't have trees is gonna look out of place. Well, it's the same thing with native plants. And then, um, then there's, there's all the gardening um, techniques that people have been using since uh, you know Victorians were gardening and even earlier, which is uh, succession planting. So you've always got something that's green or flowering or of uh, you know that looks like it's alive. Because in California, Southern California, boy, if it's not green, then it must be dead, right? We know different, but your neighbors might not. So um, planting in drifts, uh, like the picture on the left, they've got the um, looks like an Idaho fescue there, a nice drift of that. Um, it looks a little bit more formal. And um, honestly, it could have a greater environmental impact too. So um, because sometimes native animals need a critical mass of a particular plant to, um, to benefit them the most. So that's, um, that, com that, that goes to the local norms part of um, whether, whether people like your garden or not. And so this is this information is all out there, and it's been part of the academic literature since 1988, as I said. Um, I can provide a link if you're interested, but I think that's really all I had to say about cues to care. Um, it's part of the thought you should put into your, your native plant garden. And um, until everybody loves native plants more than they love their lawns, I think we're going to have to fight this battle. Back to you, Angel. Uh, thanks, Brent. Yeah, so a lot of the stuff that he put on there, they're big um, components of design. So if you plan your garden correctly, you sh really shouldn't encounter a lot of people that say that your garden is a mess because they'll see that actual thought went into making it look the way it looks. Um, but as far as choosing the right plants for your garden, there's a few considerations you have to take into account. Soil type, climate, sun exposure, and water requirements. Um, these are all going to be different for different gardeners, so it's really up to you to identify them in your garden. Um, for beginners, people that have never had a garden, or maybe you've had a garden, but you're going into native gardening now, um, some strategies are to do your research, follow some guides, CMPS has quite a few guides. Um, some of them are videos. If you don't want to read through a ton of information, you can watch some videos that have really good graphics and they show you exactly what to do. I posted a link to the Bloom resources. It has a couple of guides on there that you can watch. Um, you can also start small. When I started my native garden, I had a little flower bed. It was roses. I took the roses out and I put in succulents because I wanted to conserve water. And then I learned about natives. So I took out the succulents and I put in natives. And then once that was kind of established and I felt like, hey, this looks really good. But now the rest of my lawn is like still taking in a lot of water. I expanded. Um, you can also do a simple plant palette. 
with easy to grow varieties. Um, this not only makes it easy for you to care for your garden, but it can also help with aesthetics and it can help with habitat creation, which we'll touch upon later. If you're a little more familiar with natives, um, you probably know about microclimates within your uh, garden. Um, you can also do a little bit more about native plant combinations. When I started, I didn't really know about native plant combinations. So my first little um, garden bed didn't take into account microclimates and it didn't take into account plant combinations, pest or disease management. But once I expanded, I had, a, I had learned a little bit more. So I did take that into consideration when I went bigger. So first things first, you need to do some research on your own garden. Um, because even if you've lived in your garden for years, um, a lot of people don't know what kind of soil they have. It's easy to tell if you have a slope, if you have wet spots, um, existing structures, do you already have a tree? I had a couple of palm trees in my front yard when I moved in. So those are things you have to consider. Um, So with the type of soil you have, it's pretty important and it's going to depend on where you live, but some plants are better suited for well-draining soils. Some of them like rocky soil, some of them are more sandy. Um, so there's a couple tests you can do that you can look up. One of them is called a squeeze test where pretty much you just grab a handful of moist soil, you squeeze it, and when you open your hand, if it remains in that shape, you have clay, which is very nu nutrient rich, but it also doesn't drain well. Um, if as soon as you open it, it crumbles, it falls apart, then you have really sandy soil. So you have great drainage, but not as good um, nutrients. And then in the middle of that, you have loam, which is kind of like the ideal. Um, there's also tests you can do for pH. I, I've i never took that into account when I did mine. Like I said, when I started my native garden, I didn't do as much research as I should have. But there's some pretty easy pH tests that I've seen around. Um, I've seen clips of people demonstrating them on Instagram and Facebook where you kind of just mix baking powder and some stuff. Um, so, I mean, if you want to go the extra mile and make sure that what you're planting agrees with the soil, there's definitely some good tests out there that aren't crazy and expensive. Um, climate. We all live in Southern California. We're all part of the South Coast chapter. So you might think that, you know, we have the same climate, but my climate in Hawthorne is very different from the climate Brett has. And it's very different from the climate somebody in Long Beach, somebody in Downey has. Um, so that's something that you need to consider because there are plants that are more adapted to the coastal regions where they get a lot of marine layer. Um, if you're going to plant a coastal plant out more inland, maybe give it a little more shade, a little more water. Those are things you have to consider. Um, sun and shade is also a big factor. If you take a look at your front yard, backyard, wherever you're planning to put your plants, take a look at it throughout the day because if you only look at it at a certain time, maybe you think, oh, that spot's always sunny, but hey, maybe for the rest of the day, it's being blocked out by your neighbor's house, by your neighbor's tree or by something. So you kind of have to take a look and see how many hours of sun that one spot actually gets throughout the day. Then you have water requirements. Um, you have riparian plants, which naturally go, grow along creeks along the coast that require a little more water. And then you have plants that are very delicate and they don't really take summer water well. So you kind of want to take a look at what's recommended for each plant and make sure that you put those together. 
so that you don't have any issues. Um, this is an example of how much of a difference sun can make. The Salvia Appiana on the left, which is white sage. Um, I purchased that one, I think two years ago. It was a one gallon plant. I think it's grown maybe one or two inches in those two years. That's that's pretty much it. Um, the one on the right, I bought as a one inch plant as well. Um, this year, the flower stalks were fully a, a foot taller than I am. So six and a half, seven feet. It was giant, it was enormous. And you can see, um, I, I trimmed it pretty far back because it was starting to block my neighbor's path um, for his trash cans. So I pruned it back really hard, but you can see that there's just a ton of stems. Um, whereas with the left one, you still only have the original two stems. These plants are about three feet apart, three to four feet apart. But like I said, when I moved in, I had a palm tree in my yard that's still there. And I thought that they were going to get the same amount of sunlight. But apparently I was wrong. The one on the left gets covered by the palm tree pretty much throughout the whole day. So over the last two years, it stayed pretty much the same while the other one has, you know, exploded in growth. Um, like I said, there's microclimates in your yard as well. Um, the picture on the left is of a backyard. So this is normally a super sunny inland yard that gets tons of sun, but they have a shed and then they have a brick wall right there and then they have a persimmon tree. So all of those things combined make for a really shady spot in an otherwise super sunny backyard. The persimmon tree also gets a lot of supplemental water because they consume the persimmons. So this little spot resembles more of a riparian habitat than the rest of the yard. So while the rest of the yard could have white sage planted throughout it, this little corner, you need to plant something different. So in this case, they have metal root which is this plant here. It looks kind of like, like a fern, um, grows pretty tall as you can see, and it has white to pinkish flowers. Um, right here, if you can see my cursor, is a canyon sunflower, forgetting the scientific name, but that also grows along streams. Um, I've seen it when I've hiked in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, this year when we had a ton of rain, the stream was actually carrying water. So these plants right here make sense for this tiny little microclimate. Another plant that would go well here where you have shade and if you have like a fruit tree or something where it gets regular irrigation is hummingbird sage, which grows in a mat-like form. So it's a good ground cover. Um, that's actually one of the plants that they show here around this tree. All of these plants are hummingbird sage. They do really well under shade. They prefer it. So my white sage definitely would not like it. It hasn't grown because of the shade, but something like hummingbird sage will thrive in that shade. Then you have something like this on the right, that's um, narrow leaf milkweed. So again, planting based on location. For somebody that lives more coastal or somewhere where there's a potential overwintering site for monarch butterflies, it wouldn't be appropriate to plant this because there's research, there's debate that says that by planting native milkweed near an overwintering site, you can potentially throw off their migration pattern. So that's one thing to consider. I know milkweed is super popular. And if you don't live somewhere near an overwintering site, please buy some from our plant sale. Over the last two years, the monarch population has gone up. So we're doing something right. 
But again, if you or someone you know is considering buying milkweed, please have them buy the location appropriate milkweed, not the tropical milkweed that isn't native. And because it isn't native, um, it actually really likes our climate and it doesn't go dormant, which spreads disease. So there's a lot of little things that you have to take into consideration, um, not just depending on if you live in PV or if you live in Compton or Downey or Long Beach, but even within your own garden, you have to consider what's going on in your yard. Oh, hey, Angel, there's a question in the chat. Yes. And it's from Vanessa. Vanessa says, um, what does overwintering site mean? How can I tell if I live in one? That's a good question. I don't know how you would tell. Well, that's a really good question. Um, we just re reposted a post um, on our social media site about volunteering to be a monarch counter for this upcoming Thanksgiving monarch count and for the New Year's. Um, I'll try to post the link, um, but it, because it does give you a couple, it does give you information on what an overwintering site is. So basically it's just where monarch butterflies migrate down. Um, and it's typically where there's, I think, cypress, um, I think eucalyptus trees. If there's like a grove of eucalyptus trees, they like to go in those areas. And they pretty much just hibernate there for the winter and then they return back up north. Um, as far as identifying if you have an overwintering site, I think the best bet would be to go to the series website, um, Circe's. Um, they have a list of all of the potential and historical overwintering sites in Southern California. So you can see if you live near one, you can avoid it. Um, but I guess one thing, if you kind of just have an idea of your area is if you have groves of like eucalyptus trees, I think those are like really popular for overwintering sites. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and I think, um, yes, Wilderness Park in Redondo Beach. Um, I think El Nido Park also has one. I went out there to count and I counted three butterflies. So, yeah, definitely check out the overwintering sites for that. Yeah. Can I add something about the milkweed as well? Yeah. Uh, it Mine never looks like uh, as vigorous as yours. But um, it does disappear from my garden. So it it's that seed. The seed goes where the seed wants to go. And then the plant completely disappears. And when it pops up from its dormancy the following year, um, sometimes I mistake it for a weed because it's been gone for so long. And I and I I pick it off, I pick it and I see, oh, there's the latex oozing out of the cut stem. That wasn't what I wanted to do. So um, just be mentally prepared for the plant to be there and then to not be there. But it'll be, it's perfectly fine in the ground during the time you don't see it. Yeah, so one thing that I'll recommend is your milkweed, um, during the times when it's blooming, like this one in the picture, it looks really beautiful. But otherwise it's not a really attractive plant. And like Brent said, it dies down to the base for a few months. So this is a great plant for a spot where you know, there's not a lot going on there, maybe on the side of your yard where you keep, you know, where it's not as nice, maybe on the, yeah. So just consider that this plant isn't going to look nice the whole year. So then um, once you've kind of gotten an idea of what your, your garden site looks like, what kind of soil it has and what can go where, you can start thinking of the different plant combinations you can make. Um, one thing to consider is layering. So when you layer, you add depth and interest to your garden and it kind of mimics what plant communities do in nature. Um, and they do this to prevent 
outshading younger plants or smaller plants. Um, so as you can see, you have a big toyon in the back. Then you have smaller plants here. You have a couple of big, those look like cured grass maybe. They're a little taller, but they're surrounded by little plants. So there's just a lot of, you know, um, height differences throughout that gives a little bit of a little bit of depth and interest. Um, you also can, can consider texture and color. How do the plants look good together? Um, and this is just more of something that you can think about, like which plants look good together. We, I mean, if you've seen the super blooms, you've seen um, poppies with lupins. So yellow and blue, they really help each other pop. So think about that. Like, how do you want the colors to play with each other? Um, you can all. You should also consider seasonal interest, um, and incorporate plants that flower and stand out throughout the year. Like we said, um, the milkweed will die out, so you're gonna want something that fills in the gap. Um, and it's not only about having an interesting plant or having a green plant in your yard throughout the year, but you want to provide support to wildlife throughout the year. I mean, that's the most important goal of a California native garden. So you want to have things that are blooming in succession throughout the year so that you can always have food for um, for the for the pollinators, the birds that come to your yard. Um, we're gonna see a couple examples of layering and combinations. So on the left, you have Mother Nature's backyard. Um, this is a the demonstration garden at the Gardena Willows Wetland Preserve. So it kind of has a similar layering technique as we saw in the picture with a big plant in the back. And then you have um, low growing plants, but you have a couple of big plants in between them. So in this case, you have Artemisia in the back standing out um, down here. And on the side, you have low growing varieties of California fuchsia, which is this red plant. And you have low growing variety of buckwheat around it. In the center, this, um, white flowering plant. I think it's another variety of buckwheat. I think it's um, St. Catherine's Lace. So that one grows a little tall. So as you can see, like there's a variety of heights, but none of them block each other's view. Um, like when I said, consider how the colors look together. The bright red California fuchsia looks great with the whitish pink, um, buckwheat. It makes the fuchsia pop a little more and the buckwheat gives the garden a little bit of softness. So those are two examples of things you can consider. And the California fuchsia is great because it flowers during summer when a lot of other plants have gone dormant. So it gives really bright color to your garden and it provides nectar for hummingbirds. I see hummingbirds in my front yard on the California fuchsia all the time when it's in bloom. So that's one thing to consider. On the right is a, a, a garden on Esplanade in Redondo Beach. I think this is actually part of the Southland Conservancy's um, restoration effort. It was like their demonstration site. So this one is a little more of a natural looking garden. And as you can see, they also um, layered so that when you're walking on Esplanade to the beach, you see the different plants without having anything blocked. So down here at the bottom, you have um, a species of aster, which is this um, daisy-like plant with yellow center and purple petals. You have a type of sun cup. And then in the back, these tall plants are purple sage, which grows really big and it has really tall purple stalks of flowers. 
So these are a couple examples of what I was just talking about. Um, I don't know if anybody has a combination that they really love in their garden or if they have a plant that they really love the texture of that they want to share. No. One plant that I will say has really nice texture and I, I love it is um yarrow. Yarrow has these really like lacy feathery um leaves. Um I have it in the front of my garden as a border plant and I just love the look of it. Yeah, Angel, I'll I'll add something here. Uh and that and that is that um there's a I grow a number of plants for their foliage. And uh gray is a pretty striking color in my garden and maybe just to my eyeballs. So I've got white sage, but I've also got um, Encelia farinosa, which is a little a bit out of its range in my garden. It's more Eastern LA County plant, um, but the gray leaves are striking. And it, as, a, as a bonus, it, it will self seed a little bit. Maybe that's a bonus for you, maybe it's not. But um, really, I, it, the flowers are, are just an added bonus to the foliage, which is there you know, and beautiful nearly year round. Yeah. So we actually had a comment in the chat um, from Julian saying that they welcome volunteers to help with the Esplanade Bluff Garden. Um, and he mentioned that it's on Esplanade and Avenue A. So if you guys want to take a look at this garden um, on your own time, drive by or walk down Esplanade and take a look at their garden. Or if you want to help, please do so. They're doing really great work on that stretch of of Esplanade. Um, another thing that you guys need to take into consideration is what the space is going to be used for and what kind of look do you want for it. So you have two pretty similar gardens, um, the one on the left and the one on the right. So if you have straight lines like this, it gives more of a modern look. Um, the one on the right has curves to the path, giving it more of a natural look. Um, and if you need to, if you want to consider a focal point, both of these plants have a large manzanita, which stands out with its bright red bark. Um, maybe you want to have a water feature if you're a bird watcher or seeding so that you can see your garden and you can see what comes to visit. Um, like Brent said, that seeding and a water feature are two things that make people realize that what they're seeing was intentional. If you have a water feature, if you have seeding, it makes people look at your garden and say, hey, this is what they wanted. This isn't just, you know, a weedy garden. Um, like I said, with the paths, um, they're important not just for the look that it gives your garden, but they're essential so that you can maintain your garden. Um, you want to be able to walk in between your plants if they need pruning. Um, if they are, if you're going to water them by hand, you need to be able to get around them without, you know, trampling them. So adding paths is definitely something that you want to consider. Um, and then if you're wanting to be a little more advanced with your garden, um, some functional additions are rainwater rainwater captures so it could be something like a rain barrel it could be a dry creek bed catch basins or seeps um those look really nice they can give your house a really nice look but they're also really functional because they help prevent um rainwater um just being diverted to non-permeable surfaces like the street where they'll just get washed away this will help them 
percolate into your soil slowly and water your plants for months after the rains have passed. Um, the other thing to consider is the types of plants you want and how many of them. So I think we've all seen a lot of modern houses with yards that are pretty much empty. They either have, you know, mulch or rocks and then few plants spaced out pretty far apart. Um, that gives your yard a more modern field, um, feel, but it doesn't really create a lot of habitat, um, especially because a lot of the times when we see those types of yards, they have, um, the most common ones are cacti. Um, I see a lot of aloes and a lot of plants that don't really offer much in terms of um, habitat. But one thing that that is nice about them is that they're not overcrowded. That's something that you have to consider. Um, if you overcrowd your garden because you want it to look full and lush from the start without considering the full size of a plant when it matures, you're going to have issues down the line. Um, so we'll take a look at a couple gardens so you can get an idea of these things. So this is a garden that was submitted to us and it's in our Artemisia winter 2021 issue. Um, Tina is a social worker, I believe, at a, for a school district in Long Beach. So she didn't have a ton of experience with native plant gardening when she started but she had just moved into her house and she moved in from a apartment. So she really wanted to make the space her own. And she took the time to look at resources and guides from CMPS. She asked questions from gardeners that had some natives. So she had a pretty good idea of what she was doing when she went in. Um, her garden design is pretty cool in that she has a, a circular path. So she can walk completely around um, this middle section of her garden. She can access every plant that's in the middle. And she can access the plants that are growing on the sides along the fence. Um, I thought that was a really cool design. It flows and it makes maintenance really simple. She also added a bench, which again makes it look purposeful because now she has a spot where she can sit and take a look at all of the pollinators that come to her, her yard. Um, one thing that she didn't really consider, and she talks about this um, in the article, is the full size of the plants at maturity. Um, this bottom picture shows her garden, I think, a year or two after. The initial planting and she said that it was just completely overgrown some of the plants she didn't consider the full size so she lost some of the smaller plants um, that were shaded out she said that she also didn't consider um that some of the plants she put in spread via rhizomes so she had plants coming up through the decomposed granite um, so these are all things that are really important to consider. And these are, um, like I said, this was shared so that we could share it on our, on our newsletter. Um, I just posted the link to Artemisia Winter 2021, so you can read all about Tina's garden. But I want to encourage you guys, if you have a garden, or if you're starting a garden this year for the first time with our native plant sale, please take some pictures, some before pictures, some pictures of what went into the work um, and the final outcome and share it with us so that we can share it with everyone else. Because 
the goal with these articles is to inspire people. Maybe you're having a hard time with design and this circular um, path that Tina made is what really gets your attention. Um, maybe you're having concerns or you're worried about how to go about building a DG path. Um, Tina talks a little bit about the challenges. Um, for example, she said that when she started it, she didn't have her um, her barriers installed yet. So it became kind of a mess because she got all of the gravel and the DG delivered before she had the paths really lined up and before she had the barriers in there. And because the DG was just kind of dumped into her driveway, which she needed to go to work, she had to move everything into the garden that wasn't ready for it yet, and it made things difficult. So these are some mistakes that she made that she hopes new gardeners can avoid. She also gives some tips that made things easy for her. So that's kind of what I want from these um, these articles. I want them to help new gardeners. So maybe you feel like your garden was a failure because it took you longer than you thought. A lot of things went wrong and you have to do so much extra work to get it to what you wanted. But having those lessons um, out there for other people to learn can really help their garden be a success. So please consider sharing your garden with us. Um, this is another garden that we have in Artemisia summer 2022. So this garden was submitted by Sam. He is a, I forget what he actually does, but he he's a scientist working with birds. So when he started his garden, um, he wanted to attract birds. His first and biggest mistake, according to him, was putting down plastic to prevent weeds because as his garden grew, as he needed to do maintenance and everything, he was having to dig up plastic sheets for years. Um, but in the end, I think his garden looks amazing. It's very natural looking. Um, and he took a lot of the design ideas that I mentioned into account. Um, you can see that things are layered. You have the low growing annuals in the front. You have lupin and poppies. Then you have, I'm not remembering what this is, but you have the taller plants towards the back so that you can see them. Um, same goes here. You can see that the taller plants go to the back so that you can see everything. Um, one thing that you'll notice from Sam's garden is he didn't include any paths. He said that he wanted to make it more of a, a natural garden, so he didn't include them for that reason. But that's one thing that he talks about in his article that he kind of wishes he had included some paths because when it comes time to do some maintenance, he's having to just squeeze in between these plants. And if you see this middle picture, he has a a type of you, uh, I think it's his era something. I don't know if anybody knows, um, but the leaves are really difficult. He says that whenever he has to go in around that plant, he always ends up with tons of scrapes and cuts. Um, so that's one thing where he wishes he had incorporated paths. Um, another thing is because he didn't incorporate paths um, and he didn't really take into account the size of some of the plants. Um, when he was first starting the garden, his hose didn't reach every single plant. So we had to do a lot of manual watering with a watering can. Um, he said that it took a lot of time and 
he was pretty busy, so he lost a few plants because he didn't water them adequately. So that's something to consider. Um, maybe you want a really natural looking garden without a bench, without any um, paths, but consider what you're getting yourself into. So once you have an idea of what plants you want to get, um, now you have to do a little research into plant establishment and care. So things like watering, pruning, maintenance. So with watering, um, we have this posted on our website. Um, it's the Tree of Life guide on how to plant new um, plants. So they give you tips on how big to make the hole, how high the root ball should sit so that it doesn't get waterlogged. Um, just a ton of information to make sure that you're planting your natives correctly. In the years past, I believe we ha we've had a handful of these on site to pass out with each purchase. Um, we might, I don't know if we're going to do that again, but I think we still have some copies, so um, probably expect to see them. Um, has really great information. Um, but yeah, with watering, um, new plants need a lot of water. And that's one thing that um, I've heard a couple people say is that they lost plants, they lost new plants because they heard about how water efficient California native plants are. So they just put them in the ground and didn't really water them. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big and common mistake with California natives. They still need a lot of water at the beginning to establish their roots. Um, if we have another rainy season, like the one we had last year, you might not need to water them at all. But if we have a drier rainy season this year, um, definitely expect to have to water your plants until they're established. Once they're established, um, the watering needs are gonna vary a lot. As far as when to water them, um, morning is the best time to do it for a few reasons. One is you wanna avoid watering when it's the hottest temperature outside because a lot of that water is gonna be lost to evaporation. Another reason is California natives aren't really adapted to prolonged wet and hot conditions. If you have moist, warm soil, that's those are great conditions for pathogens um, that can cause disease and root rot to your plant. So planting, uh, watering early morning is the best strategy. Um, where around the plants and how is also something that you need to consider. And um, I'll talk about that here. So on the left, we just have um, general watering schedule for new plants from the CMPS website. Um, so you can see for the first month after planting, um, you might need to water your plants once a week. If it rains, um, you obviously can count that as, as the watering. Um, but again, depending on your soil type and the size of the plant, you also have to adjust this 30 minute recommendation. If you have clay soil that doesn't drain well, you probably will need to cut down your watering time and the frequency of it. But if you have really sandy soil, you might need to water a little more. Um, and then it goes into the second, third month, fourth, fifth, and then after the six months. Um, but like I said, as far as um, where to water them and how it makes a big um, impact on the survival of your plants. If you look down here at these plants, you have 
um, drip irrigation going around the plant, which is what you want. And you want to make sure that if you have drip irrigation, there's multiple sources of water. Um, there's multiple emitters because if you only have one emitter, say right here on the right side of the middle plant, it's going to encourage and train the plant to form a root ball around this little section. It's not going to send roots deep down or further out. And later down the line, you're going to have to water it more because you prevented um, a well-developed root system to find its own water source deep in the ground. Um, not only is it going to stunt root growth, but again, if you have consistent wet soil in one spot, it encourages pathogen growth and it encourages um, root rot. So you want to make sure that you're watering all around the plant mm. and that goes for if you're watering with a hose um don't water directly on the plant water around it same goes for if you're watering by hand with a um watering can if you have sprinkler system set up from a, a previous lawn that's something else that you have to consider um if you have overhead sprinklers um, they're typically not going to water around the plant. And if you have a sprinkler, say right here, and it's um, spraying this way, this first plant right here is going to get a ton of water while the plants in the back aren't going to get as much. So the plant right next to the sprinklers um, might not survive. They might be overwatered. So one thing to consider there is planting something that can handle all of that water. Um, we talked about um, dry creek beds like this one. If you incorporate something like that um, to divert water from your gutter downspouts towards plants, um, again, it makes the rain really useful because if you have your gutters and your downspouts just pointed towards your driveway, all of that water is being lost. It's not making it into the groundwater. If you divert it into a low spot or if you create a swale or a basin um, like this, during the rainy season, it looks really nice. Um, during the dry season, it also looks really nice and it gives your your home a little bit of interest and it reduces some of your maintenance since you don't have as many plants. This garden on the right, um, like I said, it looks a little more modern because it doesn't have plants covering everything completely. They're pretty spread out. So these are two design aspects that are worth considering so that you can take advantage of natural water um, so you can lower your water costs and you can encourage better and healthier growth. Um, pruning, the, this again also depends on the plant. Um, from CMPS, I read that it's generally done during dormancy. Um, there's thinning, there's deadheading, and cleaning. Um, so deadheading, I'm sure a lot of you know, is when you cut off the spent blooms. Um, I know a lot of people do it because they don't like the look of dead flowers. But you should consider leaving some of them because, again, if you have a California native garden, one of your biggest priorities should be habitat creation. Um, in my yard, once the blooms are spent, I see a lot of little birds around my buckwheats um, getting um, seeds. So again, it might not be aesthetically pleasing and it might be one of those things where your neighbors might hate you for it. Your neighbors might be annoyed and think that your garden looks dry and ugly because you're not cutting off the blooms, 
but you're providing food for birds. So that's something to consider. Um, thinning and cleaning just refers to um, cutting off dead branches, cutting off branches that maybe have some kind of pest or disease that you want to prevent from spreading. Um, it's, um, you can, you're also pruning to give it shape. You're pruning to provide adequate um, air circulation into your plant. Um, so one example is with salvia apiana, again, that's the white sage. Um, I read that you want to prune those in the late summer to winter. And I read that you want to prune them and shape them when they're young because they don't sprout reliably from the woody stems. Um, that hasn't been the case for me. Um, this picture here after I prune mine, it might not be easy to see, but I have a lot of sprouts coming up from the woody stems. Um, so I decided to go for a bit of a hard prune because like I said, my white sage was blocking my neighbor's path to their trash cans. So in this case, um, you know, this goes back to being considerate to your neighbors so that they don't complain. Um, I decided to risk it and give it a hard prune and see what happens because I didn't want my neighbor to break off um, stems trying to make his way through the yard with his trash cans. Here we have a couple other examples of plants. On the left, you have Mataliha poppy. Um, I'm not sure if that made it onto the wish list for our upcoming sale. Um, Tony, do you know if that was on there? Yes, it is. It is, okay, yeah, because I've had quite a few of my neighbors ask me what is this plant? Where can I buy it? Oh my God, your flowers look beautiful. So these are the flowers. Um, it's called the fried egg plant because the flowers look like a fried egg. They have really delicate um, tissue-like petals with a really bright yellow center. When it's in full bloom, I have 10, 15 bees on a single flower, but it does grow extremely large. Um, this picture on the left is when it was at its full height. It was about as tall as the house and it was just getting really wild. Um, so this picture right here shows a Mataliha poppy that was pruned down to the ground. Um, and when you trim it down to here, it sprouts back just as big as it was before. Um, the first two years that I had this plant, I didn't do any pruning because it didn't grow quite as large. And I was told that Mataliha poppy goes dormant in the summer. So the first year I was expecting it to go dormant and it didn't. I thought maybe because it was a new plant and I was still watering it. The second year I expected it to go dormant and it still didn't, so I didn't prune it again. And the third year, I regretted it because it just got way out of hand. Um, I think I filled my green um, yard waste can twice before I could remove everything, cutting it down to the ground. So this kind of goes to maintenance. Um, try to, if you find a guide, try to follow it. Um, try to do regular small maintenance so that you avoid okay. this. Because like I said, I started one Sunday um, and I cut maybe half of the plant down before my green yard waste um, can was full and I had to wait until the next week to do the other half. Um, on the right, you have lemonade berry which is another really popular plant that I think we'll probably have at our yard sale. Um, this one's really versatile in that 
if you've ever gone hiking along PV, it grows in little mounds. But if you've gone to George F. Canyon Nature Preserve or whatever it's called, uh, it's really tall and they have it hedged really nice to guide you along the path. So it definitely handles pruning really well, which is something that a lot of gardeners want. You want to, if you want to keep your garden looking nice and tidy. Um, this picture right here is from the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center. Um, I was there one time when pruning was going on. So they prune it pretty regularly to help block, um, I mean, to help prevent blocking the view of the ocean. Um, so they prune this pretty regularly throughout the year and it's still there and it looks great. So again, just because the recommendation is generally during dormancy doesn't mean that applies to all plants. Um, you definitely have to take a look at the specific plant you're looking into. Um, you also have coyote brush, which again is a plant that is found at the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center Demonstration Garden. This one is also pruned pretty regularly um, when people want the view to look good. I think this pruning was done because they were, they were holding a wedding reception or something, and they obviously wanted, you know, nice trimmed hedges and the view of the ocean. So they pruned it back pretty hard to give them that view and it's still doing great. Um, so maintenance also includes pest and disease management. So one of the big selling points of native plants is that you don't need to do as much maintenance as you do with say a lawn. Um, and you don't need to use as many pesticides or um, fertilizers as you do with a traditional lawn, which is great because you prevent chemicals from um, running off into our waterways and you prevent indiscriminate um, killing of local and beneficial insects. But just because our native plants are generally resistant to a lot of pests and diseases that um, exotic plants aren't. Doesn't mean that they're completely maintenance free. Um, you should look into how to adopt an integrated pest management strategy. So one thing is, um, ladybugs. Um, I have milkweed in my yard. So sometimes I have tons of aphids on them. It's just covered in little yellow dots. And I've never had to spray any chemicals on it because usually before it gets to be a problem, I have an army of ladybugs and other insects there that clean up the mess. Um, encouraging birds by providing habitat, like um, bird houses or bird feeder, maybe not bird feeder, feeders because then you're providing them with food, but providing habitat for them, like shrubs where they can um, hide from predators or have um, shade during the day will encourage birds to come to your garden and they can take care of some of the unwanted insects. Um, there's also non-chemical ways to get rid of them. Um, like I said, if you notice that a branch of your plant is starting to develop a disease or it's infested with aphids, you can cut off that part of the plant before it spreads and makes a bigger problem. Um, I've used, I water my garden with a hose to give it a little supplemental gardening. Um, sometimes when I notice a lot of 
and sex that aren't beneficial, I'll give the plants a nice little spray and um, knock some of the bugs out. As far as disease management, proper spacing is a big help because it promotes circulation and the spread of disease. If your plants have a little space in between them, like I said, if you notice that you have a disease or a pest on one plant, but it's not completely right up against another plant, it'll take some time to spread and you can mitigate the spread before it gets out of hand. Um, circulation also helps um, prevent um, certain like fungal infections that come about due to really moist and um, really moist conditions where you don't have a lot of circulation. So again, having a few plants spread out um, might be a good idea because it helps. In Sam's garden, everything is pretty close up. Um, but one thing that he did take into consideration was the full size of the plants when they are mature. So even though he does do a little maintenance, um, when some plants start to get a little overgrown or they don't look as nice, he does do a little maintenance. But for the most part, he doesn't have a problem with bad circulation or with plants overcrowding each other because he took the full size of the plant and maturity into account. And when you guys come to our plant sale, we're going to have a little plant profile um, of each plant. And it will give you the size of the plant when it reaches its full size. So again, when you buy them, I know it's tempting to plant a lot of things so that your garden looks full. But be sure to read what the full size is going to be. You don't want to buy a plant that's going to grow to be 5, 10 feet wide and you plant a bunch of other plants a foot away from it. Um, sanitation, again, just that's one way to remove dead and diseased plant material without having to use chemicals. And mulching, um, like I said, with, with Sam's garden, um, when he started out, he put in plastic, black plastic sheets to prevent weeds. Um, and like I said, he found out that that was a mistake um, for a couple reasons. One is mulching helps conserve soil moisture, but if you put down black plastic sheets around your plants, the water isn't actually making its way into the soil. Um, the mulch will allow the water to get into the soil and conserve it. Um, it also helps suppress weeds and it improves soil health because as it's decomposing, it's adding matter back into the garden. And again, if you have black plastic sheets, that decomposing material isn't making its way into the soil. A lot of your plants will, um, if, they if they go dormant, they'll drop their leaves. Um, so you can use that as mulch as well. Um, I know a lot of people like to rake their gardens, They're, especially if they have a lawn because they want that nice clean look. And they might complain if they see that your yard is full of leaves. But the leaves aren't just beneficial for moisture of the soil. Um, they're also beneficial because a lot of um, insects depend on the leaves. Um, the El Segundo blue butterfly, for example, um, the host plant is the, I believe it's the sea cliff buckwheat. Um, 
but yeah so it uses the buckwheat as its host plant um the flowers for for um food but then all of the leaves that fall onto the ground that's where they lay their eggs for the larva so if you're removing the leaves you're preventing habitat for a lot of um insects in my yard um when I try to do a little cleaning, um, sometimes the leaves make their way onto the path that goes to my house and I try to clean them up. In the mornings, a bunch of moths will fly out. So the leaves are definitely a part of habitat creation that you need to consider. Okay, so common mistakes and general tips. So one is planting in the wrong season. Um, if you're watching this video, hopefully it's because you plan on doing some gardening this fall, which is great. It's when you wanna do your gardening. If you plant in the summer, um, your plants are gonna have a little bit of a harder time becoming established because one, if it's a really hot summer, um, that adds a lot of stress to them. Two, like I said, um, consistent, wet, warm conditions are a perfect breeding ground for pathogens that can kill your plant. So now is the time to plant. Um, overcrowding, like I said, it prevents circulation. It prevents you from doing maintenance on your plants. So one thing I read in an LA Times article was, if you plant your garden and it looks really empty because your plants haven't filled in yet, throw some um, poppy seeds, lupin, whatever annuals you like, throw them in as a filler because they'll give your yard that full lush look with a lot of color until the plants are able to fill in those gaps. Um, like Brent mentioned, we're going to be giving out some free seed packets. A lot of the seeds we're going to be giving out are poppies. So this is great if you're starting a new garden. We're going to give you a little filler so that your garden looks nice and full from the start. You'll have a nice little super bloom in your garden this first year. and once your garden fills in the spots, um, you might have a few poppies that pop up here and there, which look nice. Um, when it comes to annuals or seeds, one tip that I was given was have a control group. So by that, I mean, whatever seeds you put in your garden, um, maybe plant one in a pot that way you can see what it looks like when it's coming out. Just because for me, after, after the rains, um, I have a ton of weeds that come up in my yard. And with some plants like poppies, it's really easy to see, hey, these are poppies. Same with lupin. Although with lupin, um, when they first come out before they get those... Um, they're like full mature leaves. You can possibly can um, mistake them for for um, for a weed. Same with some of the phacelias. Um, I planted some one year and I started doing some weeding. And a few minutes into weeding, I realized I wasn't really paying attention and I had just pulled out a ton of phacelias. So that's my little tip. If anybody has any mistakes that they want to share that they made, any tips, or if you have any questions, um, now's the time to ask. Um, I don't know if this is the opportune time or not, but um, Jim Montgomery has a, a few garden pictures he was willing to share that I think illustrated some of the things you were talking about. That was a very nice talk, by the way. You covered the territory pretty thoroughly. 
Jim, are you there? I, I made Jim a co-host. Yeah, I can share my screen if you'd like. Is this an opportune time, Angel? Yeah, perfect time. Okay, Jim, it's up to you. I think okay. Angel, you need to stop sharing, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes. So can, okay, great. So yeah, as I mentioned, Tony Baker will recognize this yard. Um, he helped me um, put it in uh, with uh, Professor County Vadheim years ago at Madrona Marsh. She had a wonderful class on designing California native plants and gardens. So I took her class and then got hooked up with Tony. And this is the yard back in 2009 where I started digging up, weeding it and mulching it. It's about a 20 foot by 25 foot front yard in the Laura Rivera part of Torrance. And it's about 100% sand. <laughs> So that's the first slide. Um, and this is after um, a couple months later, I, I dug, over, dug up everything by hand. We did and mulched it. And here is when Tony showed up with the variety of plants that he had picked out. So I'd kind of picked the plant palette I wanted. And my big goal was creating a diversity of habitat for the native wildlife. And then also getting a, a plant palette and colors that my wife liked. So here they are kind of staged. Here they are on the ground. This is February, 2010. And then you'll see just a few months later, they've already started filling quite nicely after only a few months of growth. Um, and then, um, as you mentioned, throw them the annuals in here. So I just got a wildflower mix. I made the mistake here, talking about mistakes, right? This is not our local two-colored um, poppy. It's the orange one. But there's a nice mix of things like tidy tips and clarkias, um, baby blue eyes. Um, so very nice. Um, so this is the garden. Um, 11 years ago in 2012. So you kind of see it starting to grow and fill in um, even more. Got a mixture of annuals and um, some other, a lot of perennials. And then this is the native plant garden now. And so you can see, I like the I like the wild look, I let it go. And so I've got Areogonum and Parofolium in here in the front. I keep hoping we'll get some Elsicondal Blues, <laughs> make the three quarters of a mile inland to our yard, uh, no luck yet. Um, and then we talked about certification, right? So we're certified with the National Wildlife Federation and also the Native Habitat with South Bay Parkland Conservancy. And then make it clear to everybody, this is a pesticide-free zone. And then there's that water feature I talked about um, that really, really increased the amount of wildlife that showed up, uh, birds especially. Um, and here's just some really nice pictures this year. So a pink current that really made a, makes a really nice, um, let's I'll show back here against the garage here. I wanted to sort of block that out. So talking about um, things that can block things out, that's the current there. I've got lemonade berry over here. Um, so that makes a very nice kind of hedge. Um, so yeah, so there's pink current, some of the royal lupins in the front that really exploded this year. Talk about a super bloom, another wildflower mix. And then here I finally got the two color uh, maritima. Um, so some really nice poppies there. Um, and then I don't know if this is gonna play or not, but that, there are just some short movies here. And this is just the yellow-faced bumblebee. And I've got an Ackman blue over here. I don't know how that's showing for everybody. But it's just really nice, right? Just seeing all the life that showed up in our yard. Um, back where it was just crabgrass, not much of anything, but now a lot of life. And that's it. And I will stop sharing. Oh, thank you, Jim. Are there any questions from the audience? Angel, that was a really, like I said, really thorough presentation. And I appreciated it. I didn't know you had such a design, uh, a design oriented brain. I'll have to tap you on the shoulder when I've got a question next time. Well, I'm a interior designer, so kind of. <laughs> I have never done gardens yet, but maybe someday. Oh, there's some other chat. All right. Tony says, uh, looking good, Jim. So thank you, Jim, too, for sharing. Farrell says, wonderful garden, Jim. And then Wally left earlier. He, he gave uh, Angel a compliment. Thank you, Angel, for the presentation. Everyone's advice. Says Brian. Uh, yeah, actually, one thing to add on to what Jim said, because my little sister just made this mistake. Um, she bought a packet of Oh, wild wild native, seed. yeah, from Amazon. And she was like, oh, my God, look what I bought for my yard. And I saw the picture and she showed me a picture of what it contains. And there was a lot of annuals that weren't 
California natives. Um, so that's a big tip for you guys. Um, buy your seeds from a reputable source. She got hers from Amazon. Um, so it had, it definitely had, um, native plants in there. It had poppies, it had lupins, but like Jim said, it didn't have the poppies that are appropriate for her location. Um, the lupins aren't appropriate for her location either. And then it had a couple of other annuals that do well in Arizona. Um, that's where they're from. And I guess they do well here because of that. But yeah, that's one mistake. Um, get your seeds from an actual local source. Yeah. Um, Julian and Heather have the same problem. They're still uh, pulling out weeds. Although, Heather, I got to point out that telegraph weed, native plant right there. Um, but um, they're pulling out, Jim's pulling out fescue after 20 years of having a native plant garden. He's not using any herbicides. Um, and Heather says she's got the same problem. Um, so I, I don't, when I see it, I pull it. I like, if I walk out to my car and I happen to see some weeds, I pull it. My neighbor this year finally uh, wood chipped her yard and the five foot high weeds that were blowing into my yard um have greatly diminished so hopefully that'll help my diminish my seed bank uh, angel or does anyone else have any questions about how you know garden practices to reduce the non-native plants that drift into the yard or maybe are the, already there in the seed bank aside from wood chip mulch julian and heather i'm assuming you've got wood chip mulch right yeah, oh, Tony says, pull them before they seed. Oh, yeah. If they go to seed, oh, some of these grasses that seed, they pop up like stealth attacks in the middle of your plants. Tony's favorite, I can't remember the name of it, but it, it, it's it got set seed and it drops it before you can even find the plant typically. It's fast. Um, that would be a Horda erecta or panic velt grass. Yeah, That's your, my favorite special, your special nemesis, I think. Any other any other comments there? Heather's got wood chip mulch. And she's trying to pull things before they seed. Your neighbors, your neighbors matter. Boy, I had all kinds of weeds from my my immediately adjacent neighbor, and uh I, far fewer this this year. Um, you know what? Here's the other thing I use. I use a special hoe to get the weeds out. Like if I in the in the wintertime it rains and and I'll go out there and my paths are overgrown with all kinds of things, including native plants. Um, but I've got this hoe that's it's um, called a scuffle hoe. I think you can Google a scuffle hoe and find it. But it's, or a winged hoe. It's a hula hoe is kind of a, a variant of it, but it doesn't disturb the soil very deeply. It kind of surfs along the top of the soil or in the top 16th or quarter inch, and it cuts the cuts the weeds out. And when it cuts them out like that, then you don't disturb much of the seed bank that's down below that level. And um, so uh, I'll see if I can find a link and I'll post it in the chat. But that hoe is my go-to hoe for a lot of things. Now, it doesn't really work if your soil dries out and it's hard clay. You've got to get it before that stage. And you should wear some glasses when you when you weed it because uh, it, it'll kind of pull small rocks and things out of the soil and fling them at your face. Um, but it's it's a very effective hoe. Yeah, it's this is not quite a hula hoe. I've had bad luck with hula hoes. Let me let me see if I can find the actual hoe. It is. I'll post that in the uh, in the chat. Um, um, while you're looking for that, Brent, um, I had a neighbor one time. I was doing some gardening, and he was walking down the street um, with his dog, and we started talking. And he said that in his yard, he uses this um, weed spray that I believe it's just um, a mixture of like vinegar with something um, or maybe not vinegar, but it's just um, 
or something organic and he sprays it with one of those little garden pumps he said that he puts the nozzle so that it's a really fine spray and he just hits the weeds um he says that if you do it when it's like direct sunlight it scorches them so that might be something for the grass um i can't remember the name of it um because i never used it but he said that again the product claims that it's um organic that it um um that it doesn't affect the soil uh you can plant the next day after it so i don't know how accurate that is but it might be worth looking into if hand pulling isn't completely working yep so yeah there's a hand tool i use that's a i put a link in the in the chat but there's you know you can find them on amazon and they're sold as a as a japanese kind of bladed scuffle hoe and then if you google scuffle hoe you'll come back with a few things that are likely candidates they're they're edged tools and like i said they kind of surf along um scuffle hoe there's a i just put the scuffle hoe link in there um, those aren't the ones that I have. There's other designs, uh, but I I like those a lot. And then yeah, vinegar. I wouldn't honestly. I wouldn't use the Epsom salt. I would use straight vinegar. But the other thing you can use is you can use flame. If you've got a propane torch, you can just scorch the weeds as they show their little heads. And if you scorch them to the point where they wilt, you don't want to burn them. You just want to wilt them hard. Uh, they lose vigor and they'll die. So um, don't discount the possible use of a of a propane torch. Or a tool that's made for that job if you've got enough area to cover. Um, needless to say, don't use that on dry large weeds. It's the it's the smaller green ones that are just poking their heads up. And you can cover a lot of territory with a propane torch. Any other bright ideas for weeds? Well, I've gotten to use needle nose pliers to get in there where the stems are and just yeah. get them at the base and do a little yank. Man, that they've they've just all retreated to in between like the Matilla hop poppy stems. You know, they pop up in there and oh yeah, I you know that doesn't sound like you have uh, done a poor job. It sounds like you are having a normal amount of weeds. They pop up. They're, they're still going to pop up in the middle of plants. Um, Need a normal sure. amount of OCD to do this. Okay. Well, that 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 might be the real cause of the uh, of your concern with weeds. But try the tools. Try the vinegar. I like the idea about needleless pliers. Um, I usually just scrape at the ones that come out of cracks in the ground. And then Jim's noting that he uses a, a tea kettle full of boiling water which is the same idea as kind of hitting it with a propane torch. You just kind of thermalize them and they'll wilt back and die. I, I read um, somebody um, talk about doing that. They have a they have a path going down the middle of their yard um, with pea pebbles and some stepping stones. And that's what they use to kill the weeds that grow in between the rocks. Um, the one thing that they did say was it takes a lot more water than they expected to need to use. Yeah, maybe so, if you have one of those instant hot water things, it's a little bit faster going. Yeah, just be prepared to take multiple trips into the kitchen, according to them. So on their pathways, they use boiling water? Yeah, they just pour a little bit of it onto the actual weed and it just wilts and dies. Yeah, oh, and then Karen, Karen notes that if you have thinner, more tactile gloves instead of the thick ones, then you can pull them, pull things a bit easier. Better grip, she notes, and then um, probably you can grip a little bit lower down on the stem to get more of a root. And, uh, and Jim agrees with, oh, he agrees with the, uh, back and forth from the kitchen with the hot kettle. And Tony, Tony's got hands made out of uh, leather. He says bare hands are even better. I gotta agree. Uh, Tony has been to the ER though. 
urgent care because of a weed injury. So he, he didn't tell you that. Jim gives him a thumb up, thumbs up. I'll give him a thumbs up too. All right, I think I think we're about at the end of the meeting. We're looking forward to seeing you guys at the plant sale. And um, more importantly, we'd like to um, encourage you, if you don't have one already, to start a native plant garden. It is easier than you think. Angel, any last words? Uh, no, if you do start a garden, please share it with us. Yeah, makes, makes sense to me. All right, thank you guys for attending. We'll see you later. Night, everyone. And I, I'm going to end the recording first.